This is Randy Shell. I'm making a podcast entitled Toxicity and Temperature. It's part of our anesthesiology keyword review at the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology. The keywords that we will cover under these topics of toxicity and temperature include carbon monoxide, cyanide toxicity, insecticides, nerve gases, anticholinergic syndrome, and under temperature, malignant hyperthermia, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, serotonin syndrome, perioperative temperature regulation, and hypothermia physiology. These will be very brief vignettes uh, surrounding a discussion of the key words listed here. We'll start with carbon monoxide. Normally carbon monoxide levels are less than approximately 3% in non-smokers. In smokers, the carboxyhemoglobin level can get up in the range of 4 to 9 percent and if we are exposed in some way to incomplete combustion such as in a burning building, a furnace that is not working properly, automobile exhaust, our carboxyhemoglobin levels can rise and when they get into the 15 to 20 percent range overt signs of toxicity such, such as headache, nausea, vomiting can occur and as carboxyhemoglobin levels increase Signs of severe toxicity such as seizures, myocardial ischemia leading to unconsciousness, and death can occur. Even in our anesthesia machine, under certain conditions such as a very dry CO2 absorber in the presence of desfluorane or less often isofluorane, carbon monoxide can be formed. Carbon monoxide has effects on auction delivery. It causes a left shift in the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, a lower P50. It decreases the amount of oxygen that's bound to hemoglobin, therefore decreasing the blood oxygen content and impairing release of oxygen to the tissues. Carbon monoxide not only binds to hemoglobin, but also can bind to myoglobin, some of the cytochromes and mitochondrial cytochrome oxidases that may contribute to the toxicity syndrome. Symptoms include a headache, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, disorientation, seizure, shock, coma, and death. Uh, tachypnea is uh, absent. Why does a patient not breathe rapidly? Because the carotid bodies are sensitive to the partial pressure of oxygen and not to the oxygen content. And therefore, if the partial pressure of oxygen does not decrease dramatically, it is the oxygen content that's decreasing dramatically. Uh, the patient will not be tachypnic. The diagnosis of carbon monoxide toxicity uh, can be made with an arterial blood gas and not with our normal SpO2 monitor. Carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin very strongly and it affects the SaO2 and the oxygen content but not the little uh, arterial partial pressure of oxygen, P little a O2 then. SpO2 monitor or pulse oximeter will merely go along reading relatively high if it is a two-wave wavelength pulse oximeter because carboxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin absorb very similarly. So it's not uncommon to have a high SpO2 with relatively high levels of carbon monoxide uh, bound to hemoglobin. If you draw a blood gas, however, and, and send it off and run it through a cooximeter, it will come back with a low SaO2 or saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen and normally the carboxyhemoglobin level should be less than approximately 3 to 5 percent. If someone has carbon monoxide toxicity they will have a low SaO2, a high carboxyhemoglobin level, often an anion gap metabolic acidosis can be present as well as a normal partial pressure for oxygen. If you measured a mixed venous oxygen level, it will be low. Why? Because there's less oxygen delivered to the tissues which continue to utilize oxygen and as the hemoglobin comes back to the central circulation and a specimen is drawn, say for example from the distal pulmonary artery, which is where mixed venous is taken from, then it will reflect a greater extraction of oxygen from what is supplied to the tissues and a low mixed venous saturation. Let's say, for example, instead of the normal in the 70% range, 
now down in the 40 or 50 percent range, and lactate may also be uh, 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 measured in that uh, blood gas. The treatment for carbon monoxide toxicity is oxygen, uh, supplemental oxygen, and if there's very high levels of carbon monoxide or the patient's pregnant or having angina, hyperbaric oxygen can be used because supplemental oxygen decreases the half-time of carboxyhemoglobin from uh, hours uh, down to much shorter periods of time, even down in the range of 15 to 30 minutes when hyperbaric oxygen is utilized. The next topic is cyanide toxicity. Now, how can we get cyanide in our bodies? Well, nitroprusside, uh, which is infused for controlled hypotension and to control very high blood pressures in patients, if it is administered at relatively high infusion rates, cyanide toxicity can occur. Also, cyanide can come from exposure to fire, smoke, burning plastic inhalation layer, in a closed space. So a patient taken from a burning building may have carbon monoxide poisoning as well as cyanide toxicity. Cyanide uh, inactivates the cytochrome oxidase system. It, it poisons it such that oxygen can't be used and ATP and ADPH formed and so it, at the tissue level oxygen is not being used. You sus suspect when a patient is on nitroprusside and has the following uh, things that uh, you notice. Tachyphylaxis, that is, you have to keep going up on the concentration of nitroprusside to have this same hypotensive effect. Metabolic acidosis with increased lactate because the tissues are being poisoned. They're not using oxygen uh, in an aerobic manner, but an anaerobic manner and producing lactate. And because the tissues are not using oxygen, the uh, hemoglobin comes back oxygenated and there's an increased mixed venous oxygen uh, level that can be measured. CNS dysfunction is often present also. So the treatment for cyanide toxicity is remove the source of the cyanide, which could be nitroprusside, stop it, um, administer oxygen, uh, including the possible treatment with hyperbaric oxygen, noting that both carbon monoxide and cyanide toxicity can be treated with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. The cyanide antidote package uh, that uh, is commercially available contains uh, several drugs. Sodium thiosulfate is one of those which supplies sulfur uh, for our livers to take the sulfur molecule and combine it with cyanide and form thiosulfate with the presence of rhodonase enzyme. And then thiosulfate can be excreted and when in the kidneys, assuming that you don't have renal insufficiency. Thiocyanate can actually build up in patients with renal failure and cause toxicity in and of itself. Let's assume a patient has normal renal function, then providing Thiosulfate, a sulfur donor, can allow the body to produce the thiocyanate and then get rid of it in the kidney. Now also a drug called amyl nitrate can be used to convert hemoglobin to methemoglobin. It oxidizes Fe plus 2 to Fe plus 3. Uh, Fe plus 3 is methemoglobin then. Um, and methemoglobin can bind cyanide and form cyanomethemoglobin. We have a lot of hemoglobin in our body, so therefore using a little bit of it to convert to methemoglobin and bind the free cyanide ion um, uh, will be helpful to get rid of the free cyanide ion, ion effect, which is at the cytochrome oxidase, poisoning it so it can't use oxygen. And in severe acidosis, bicarbonate can also be given. The next topic is insecticides and nerve gases, and I'll show you in the picture on the top right, the treatment for nerve gas poisoning, which is atropine. Now, how would you be exposed to insecticides or nerve gases? The farmer classically administering pesticides, organophosphate pesticides can develop this uh, cholinergic crisis. A soldier who is exposed to nerve gases, which are organophosphates also, nerve gases like sarin or VX gas, these drugs and pesticides, nerve gases, inhibit acetylcholinesterase. If we inhibit the enzyme that 
breaks down acetylcholine, there's tons of acetylcholine around, and a cholinergic crisis can occur. Well, if there's tons of acetylcholine around, what's going to happen? Your pupils are going to be small. You can have a bronchospasm, bradycardia, skeletal muscle weakness, and progress on to shock and death. The treatment for cholinergic crisis is to block the effects of the acetylcholine with the anticholinergic drug atropine. Uh, the addition of another drug called praledoxine uh, has been used in the past, but currently this is controversial. The main treatment for organophosphate poisoning is atropine. The next topic is central anticholinergic syndrome. When drugs like scopolamine or atropine, which could be administered preoperatively as a premedicant, uh, are given, these drugs, being tertiary amines, can cross the blood-brain barrier, and when they do, they can mess with the cholinergic system in the central nervous system. Interestingly, glycopyrrolate, which is a quaternary amine and a charged molecule, doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier and won't cause this central anticholinergic syndrome. Patients who have received scopolamine or atropine can have clinical features of anticholinergic syndrome as listed in the uh, graphic on the far right. Things like uh, mental status changes, confusion and restlessness, and seeing things that aren't there, and picking at objects in the air, and mumbling, and tremor, and myoclonus. And peripherally, their pupils are dilated, and they're tachycardic, and they have a very dry mouth. Um, the treatment for this central anticholinergic syndrome is a drug called antilirium, or uh, the generic name is physostigmine. Physostigmine crosses the blood-brain barrier, inhibits central acetylcholinesterase, raising acetylcholinesterase uh, molecules in the brain and decreasing the clinical features of this syndrome. Neostigmine and pernostigmine do not cross the blood-brain barrier. Malignant hyperthermia is the next topic. A patient who is genetically susceptible, often an issue with the ryanodine receptor, and exposed to a trigger, triggers being the volatile inhaled agents, such as sevoforine, isoforine, uh, desforine, and succinylcholine. Um, they can be exposed to one or the other or both with these triggers in a genetically susceptible individual. They can go on to develop the full-blown malignant hyperthermia uh, episode. Things that aren't triggers include our drugs like propofol, atomidate, mebazolam, ketamine, opiates, Pyridol, nitrous oxide, rocuronium, and our local anesthetics. There is some association with certain musculoskeletal diseases, including central core disease and King Denborough syndrome. It appears that Duchenne's and other muscular dystrophies uh, are only weakly associated with MH. In fact, uh, many uh, experts will say that they are not associated. So put central core disease and King Denborough syndrome. Uh, in your mind as associated with malignant hyperthermia, not so much to shames. Presentation of malignant hyperthermia early is muscle rigidity. And this muscle rigidity can occur even when the patient is administered rocuronium because the problem is at the muscle itself, the sarcoplasma reticulum, lots of calcium around, and uh, the troponin, tropomyosin cross-linking and the muscle being rigid, not at the neuromuscular junction where the rock running would have its effect. The patient is also tachycardic and hypercarbic because there's uh, hypermetabolism going on with the muscles that are rigid and the troponin, tropomyosin cross-link occurring, and the muscles are creating heat and carbon dioxide, and we detect this as an increase in temperature, which is a late finding and increased end tidal CO2, which is a earlier finding. So some of the late findings other than hyperthermia are acidosis, a decrease in mixed venous oxygen because we're using so much oxygen at the tissue level with all of these muscles becoming rigid, cyanosis modeling, hyperkalemia with peak T waves, and uh, brown urine, which is indicative of breakdown of muscle with release of myoglobin, and dysrhythmias uh, cardiac dysrhythmias can occur. Malignant hyperthermia treatment primarily is to 
get rid of the inhaled anesthetic and uh, you've already administered possibly succinylcholine, but if you're administering a volatile inhaled anesthetic, stop it. Call for help immediately. Dantrolene uh, is the primary treatment, 2.5 milligrams per kilogram IV as initial bolus, because dantrolene inhibits calcium release from sarcoplasmic reticulum. It doesn't stop the reuptake, but it inhibits the release, so the calcium levels inside the cell decrease, and there's less cross-linking of the troponin tropomyosin and less muscle rigidity and stopping the MH episode. Symptomatic treatment includes uh, hyperventilation of the patient, cooling of the patient, correcting metabolic acidosis with sodium bicarbonate, treating hyperkalemia uh, with uh, hyperventilation, uh, and maintaining urine output with drugs like mannitol and Lasix. If cardiac dysrhythmias occur, procainamide and lidocaine are uh, drugs that may be used. Do not use calcium channel blockers, i.e. to slow ventricular response, for example, with an atrial dysrhythmia such as atrial fibrillation. There's an association between calcium channel blockers and dantrolene when those are administered together of uh, cardiac problems, including severe hyperkalemic arrest. Check your blood gas concentrations regularly. Monitor the patient. Continue dantrolene and further doses as needed. Realizing that recrudescences, uh, reoccurrences, return of the malignant hyperthermia uh, symptoms can occur even after dantrolene is given a couple times and it may need to be continued for up to 72 hours. Call the uh, MH hotline uh, and get help if you need it. It is a 24-hour telephone physician consult hotline where you can talk one-on-one -on -one with the physician and help guide you through the treatment of this patient. Screening for MH uh, is with a muscle biopsy and exposure of that muscle to halothane, ca halothane and caffeine, which causes contracture. And so the halothane-caffeine contracture test is the classic test when you take a patient uh, or their family and are looking for evidence of uh, malignant hyperthermia susceptibility. The next topic is neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And this is a derangement of dopaminergic receptors in the hypothalamus because usually it's caused by dopamine blocking drugs. And many of these dopamine blocking drugs are psychotropic drugs like Thorazine and Haldol and uh, uh, other psychotropic drugs Acute withdrawal of Parkinson's disease uh, medications can result in neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It is like a slow onset malignant hyperthermia. Muscles can be rigid, rigid, but it's a central effect. The dopamine on the central nervous system, the dopamine blocking that is on the central nervous system, rather than like in MH where it is a lyanidine receptor, calcium, sarcoplasmic reticulum, cross-linking of those troponin, tropomyosin, and at the muscle itself. So rather than a peripheral uh, effect, it is a central effect, and it's a slow onset rather than a classic fast onset of true MH. And that's why people sometimes call it that slow onset malignant really hyperthermia. The management is to discontinue the neuroleptic medications, uh, and dantrolene can be used just as it was used in MH, also, dopamine receptor agonists like bromocryptine or amantadine can be used. So neuroleptic malignant syndrome can present like MH with rigidity and hyperthermia and acidosis, tends to be a slower onset, and is also treated with dantrolene. But the problem is dopamine blocking drugs in the central nervous system resulting in this syndrome. Serotonin syndrome is the result of excess serotonin in a patient often related to uh, medications that are combined together. Things like MAO inhibitors combined with tricyclines, combined with SSRI type drugs, opiate analgesics like fentanyl, cough medicine drugs like dextromethorphan, and many others that are listed here. Meperidine, fentanyl, and ondansetron are ones that we would use occasionally in our armamentarium of drugs
that might, in combination with other drugs, such as SSRIs, result in a serotonin syndrome, which is a cluster of autonomic motor and mental status changes because of this excess serotonin. And with mild symptoms, you can get dilated pupils and tachycardia, and the temperature starts to go up. And with moderate symptoms, uh, you can get altered mental, mental status. You can even get rigid, like MH, and like uh, the neuroleptic malignant syndrome that was previously discussed, tremor, clonus, and hyperreflexia, and then it goes on to severe hypertension, hyperthermia, muscle rigidity, tachycardia, and, and potentially death. Uh, early management stages, uh, get rid of the drug, stop these drug-drug interactions, avoid things that raise serotonin. Uh, benzodiazepines can be used uh, for short periods of time. For moderate levels, uh, cyproheptadine is a serotonin antagonist uh, that can be administered and if it's very life-threatening, you may need to do all the above, plus put them in an intensive care unit, give them drugs to control their blood pressure, to cool them, to sedate them, and maybe even uh, ventilate the patient. So comparing these syndromes that can result in altered mental status and elevated temperature, which were neuroleptic malignant syndrome, serotonin syndrome, anticholinergic syndrome, and malignant hyperthermia here, We'll first look at neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which was caused by antipsychotics affecting the dopamine receptor. The patients are rigid in this syndrome, just like they are in serotonin syndrome, just like they are in MH. They <clears throat> will tend to be uh, um, uh, have normal pupillary size, and if you look at their drug record, you'll find antipsychotics having been used. Serotonin syndrome, the patient will often be rigid muscle tone, their pupils will be dilated, their temperature will be up, and if you look in their drug record, you'll often see combinations of drugs that raise serotonin. Things like antidepressants, SSRIs, fentanyl, linazolid, sumatropan, ondansetron. The anticholinergic syndrome, when drugs uh, um, like scopolamine and atropine, which cross the blood-brain barrier, are given, the patient will not be rigid, but they will be dry, and dilated pupils, and be confused, and their temperature can go up also. The treatment for anticholinergic syndrome, as you remember, was antilirium or physostigmine. Malignant hyperthermia, the trigger was the inhaled anesthetics and or the succinylcholine. The patients are rigid with a uh, high temperature, and we can then compare and contrast these in an attempt to determine what is the cause of an altered mental status and an elevated temperature in a patient. Let's finish up with a discussion of temperature and specifically perioperative hypothermia. Some of the mechanisms of heat loss in the operating room include radiated, radiation heat loss, that is losing heat to, for example, the cold walls of the operating room, and that's part of the reason we keep the room warm, convection, air blowing over us, conduction where we're in contact with something that's very cold, evaporation if uh, water, alcohol, or anything is put on our bodies and it evaporates. Number one is radiation heat loss. Now the rate of development of hypothermia in the perioperative period, if you look at the patterns of decreases in temperature over time, you'll see a graph as appears on the far right. In the first 30 to 60 minutes, there's a rapid initial heat loss uh, and drop in temperature of approximately 1 to 1 and a half degrees centigrade. And the reason why that occurs is because there is vasodilation induced by, for example, our volatile anesthetics like sevoforane, isoforane, desforane. And the blood that is in our periphery, which is cool, redistributes and mixes with our core. And so this redistribution of core heat to the peripheral, peripheral tissues results in this sudden drop over the first 30 to 60 minutes in temperature. And that's shown by the arrow on the far right, the core to peripheral heat redistribution. And then it slows down a little bit as we uh, start to lose heat more from radiation heat loss. And then as some of your body uh, regulatory mechanisms kick in, uh, core, uh, temperature tends to be maintained.
but at a lower level than it would if the patient was not anesthetized. Postoperatively, if a patient is shivering, what do we do? We put a forced air warmer over them. Sometimes give IV a demo meperidine to a patient to decrease the shivering. If you draw a blood gas from a patient who is hypothermic, and it, it, being the arterial blood gas, is corrected for the patient's real temperature, not 37 degrees, but let's say 34 degrees, hypothermia actually decreases the partial pressure of oxygen, the partial pressure of CO2. Those molecules don't have as much kinetic energy and don't exert as much partial pressure. And so PaO2 uh, and CO2 will be decreased. And it can start to look like a respiratory alkalosis as the temperature goes down with an increase in pH. So remember, hypothermia can alter arterial blood gas measurements. The mechanisms of heat conservation uh, while anesthetized include vasoconstriction and shivering. Now those are our usual mechanisms of heat conservation, but those don't work as well when we're anesthetized. In fact, vasoconstriction is impaired both under general anesthesia, desflurane, sevoflurane, and isoflurane, and spinal anesthesia or epidural anesthesia. Shivering, which we will do when we're cold and awake, is impaired or even absent under general anesthesia. And obviously, if neuromuscular blockade, for example, brachyronin is provided, the patient will not shiver. On the far right shows a graphic with desflurane concentration on the x-axis increasing and the threshold in degrees centigrade for shivering, constriction, and sweating on the y-axis. And you can see that as you have increasing concentrations of desflurane, the threshold at which you will shiver and uh, vasoconstrict is decreased. And so our mechanisms of heat conservation are reduced uh, under general anesthesia. And there's comparison here with opioids, which are a little bit less in effect on shivering and constriction, and dexmedetomony, which is a little bit less than desborine, and propofol, which has a pretty uh, uh, extensive effect on uh, shivering and constriction thresholds. So how do we prevent and treat hypothermia? Well, warm the room uh, to like 23 degrees centigrade, but that's often quite uncomfortable. Uh, in our pediatric anesthesia rooms, we'll warm the rooms to try to prevent the radiant heat loss. Forced air warming, however, is the most effective method to warm a patient. Not putting a warming mattress on them or underneath them like a water mattress or putting a humid event in or warming their IV fluids. None of these are very good but forced air warming by far is the most effective way of preventing and treating hypothermia. And in fact, if you put a forced air warmer on a patient before they go back to the operating room and warm their periphery, you may actually reduce that initial decrease in core to peripheral mixing of blood and redistribution and uh, decrease that initial drop that occurs in temperature in the first 30 to 60 minutes. Lastly, what are some of the physiologic and pathophysiologic effects of moderate hypothermia and complications of mild hypothermia? Well, hypothermia decreases oxygen consumption and CO2 production. It decreases cerebral metabolism uh, and cerebral blood flow. It decreases the metabolism of some of our drugs, and the kidney doesn't work quite as well, and you can get a cold diuresis, both from uh, an increased sodium and water excretion from the kidney. The systemic vascular resistance tends to be increased. Patients are vasoconstricted when they're cold, and they often will become bradycardic. The patient that has gone through a trauma, let's say a motor vehicle accident, is pulled from a car after an extended period of time of exposure to cold elements, often come in very vasoconstricted, and as you warm them, their blood pressure can drop dramatically, especially uh, when uncovering a relative hypovolemia or under-resuscitated patient. Some complications of mild hyperthermia, uh, that is mild hypothermia or cold, is increased blood loss, your platelets don't work as well, your coagulation system doesn't work as well, immunity is decreased and wound infections can be increased, uh, norepinephrine levels go up and patients can be tachycardic and vasoconstricted, hypertensive, and shivering, which can increase oxygen demands, 
uh, and cause myocardial ischemia, increasing the incidence of post-operative myocardial events. So let's prevent hypothermia. And the, one of the most common ways to do that is forced air warming and preventing radiant heat loss by warming the operating room. This ends our toxicity and temperature keyword discussion. Hope you have a great day.